I, I think I lean towards coaching females because I think that females are um, easier to coach. Mm. They, Meaning that they're more coachable. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Um, here's I here's I, I heard a basketball coach say this once. He says if you talk to a team of of um, male basketball players, and you say we need to be tougher, we need to give more effort. The individual players in the team are thinking in their heads, looking around like, yeah, they do need to be tougher. <laughs> they need to give yeah. more effort. Whereas a female says that, and the female goes, he's talking to me. Yeah. I need to be tougher. I. Need... They just take ownership really well. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stopping. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. How are you, Ben? I'm good. Thanks, Patrick. Today we're going to dive into something we've talked about a little bit in the past, um, and that is coaching and specifically coaching higher level athletes or, or high level coaching, however you might however you might phrase it. Um, we got a bunch of questions from, from listeners as it relates to um, the practice of coaching CrossFit Games athletes, right? Cool. Specifically yeah, that. Yep. Um, so I've got a handful of questions. We'll just kind of go through them and see where the conversation gets us. The first one is... Um, are there data points? Is there, are there, I don't want to call it, say technologies, but, but are there things that you're doing on a, on a, on a technological level that you found to be helpful, useful, help you guide mm. or help you make decisions about, um, where you're going with Katrin or where you're going with Brooke? Mm -hmm. Um, or is, you know, you're, you're, uh, for those who know you're notoriously anti-technology. So, mm. or, <laughs> you know, or do you look at that and say, it's not for me, I don't need it what's the point of it yeah um yes <laughs> <laughs> okay so i i'm not a i just i'm not a technology guy yeah. you're right so um but that doesn't deter me from trying everything that we possibly can yeah. so i'm way more interested in a competitive advantage than i am anything else yeah. so um, usually what happens is I try things myself mm -hmm. and then if I feel like there might be some use, I'll bring it to my athletes. So specifically, what does that mean? So do we use different data points, metrics, um, insight into the inner workings of the human body to try to help improve their performance? The answer is we've done HRV testing. We've done stress testing. We've, um, done sweat tests. Um, we've done uh, poop tests. We've done blood tests. So we are doing yep. all. Um, we're doing all of it. Is there something that we've seen that has massively moved the needle in any of those directions? No, mm -hmm. but um, it's not to say that we don't take the information that we learn from those and use it all the time. Yeah. So, um, for example, like the sweat test. Yep. Uh, the sweat test, what that goes is you wear essentially like one of those like stick, like a tattoo, like one of those like temporary tattoo things, mm. just like, almost like a band-aid. Essentially yep. you wear a band-aid on your arm. You weigh yourself before you work out. You weigh yourself afterwards. And then you mail in the little band-aid that absorbs your sweat. Um, and from that, they calculate how what your sweat rate is, so how much you sweat, and your sweat concentration. So... You may sweat a ton, but you might not have a high concentration. So you don't need to replace electrolytes as much, but you need to replace water a lot. Yep. And somebody else might be the opposite. They don't sweat nearly at all. So they don't need to replace their water, but their concentration that they lose is super high. So they replace more electrolytes. We've, we use that. That's, that's a metric that we've used going forward for, you know, training, competition and everything in between. Yeah. Um, similar to that, our athletes, a lot of our athletes use like sleep um, yep. Trackers, trackers or, yep. and stuff like that. I don't look for the data from that, from them. So the other answer to that is, um, while we try all this stuff, we're not doing anything on an ongoing basis. We're getting certain data points. I know where my athletes zone one, zone two, zone, two, zone one, zone, zone two. two, zone three, zone four, and like their VO two max is, yep. but we don't retest that. Yep. I know where their lactic threshold is, but we don't retest that. So the answer is kind of both. Yeah. I'm willing and I want to use and get as much as I possibly can, but we don't retest it. And the next side of that is it doesn't guide what we're doing in the gym. 
The goal is not to increase your VO2 max. The goal is not to increase your lactic threshold. The goal is not to nail your hydration levels. The goal is to increase your work capacity across broad diamond mold domains. The goal is to get better at pull-ups, thrusters, running, rowing, and so on. So those are all um, tools, but they're not things that are going to drastically move the needle. The things that are going to move the needle is how much better we can get at our technique and our engine. So can we improve our skills? Can we get more work capacity? Mm -hmm. And that's where we put the emphasis in. The way I do that is on a daily basis, getting information from them. But what I found is that more predictive and more accurate than um, what is your what was your HRV or what was your resting heart rate um, today is the simple question of a coach having a real conversation with the athlete of how are you feeling today? Don't answer good. Yeah. And then they yeah. go, because they always go, good. And you go, don't answer good. They go, okay, well, I feel okay. Well, what do you mean by okay? Is it your energy levels? Is it your um, mood? Is your excitement to train? Is it your soreness? Or is it a joint? And they're like, ah, oh, it's kind of, And now you, you have a real conversation, getting real insight into what the athletes are experiencing in their body, not uh, uh, what a, a screen is saying about their HRV. Not mm-hmm. to say that, that stuff isn't totally useful, or, or not that saying that stuff is totally useless, because it could be a piece of the puzzle. It's not not the driving factor for us. Got it. Um, Another question uh, that we get, or I get a lot, um, we've talked about peaking before in terms of how you program for CrossFit Mm -hmm. or, you know, does peaking exist inside of a CrossFit programming, you know, for for CrossFit or not? Is that is, is, how do you think about peaking for CrossFit Games athletes, given that um, at least you have a good sense of, maybe get, have a good sense of like when they're going to be competing. Does that allow you to create a peak uh, program that peaks yep. or is there something about peaking that still doesn't make sense for the the sport that they're, that they're competing in? We 100% um, try to peak for the CrossFit games yep. and we throughout the year are operating at desired sub optimal levels throughout the year. So immediately after the games, I want, it's all about rest and recovery. So in that sense, it's the opposite of peaking. I want them to be able to, I I don't need them to be able to um, do huge levels of work output or sustain super high levels of a heart rate or anything else. Um, Throughout the year, that continues to build. And it's not a linear line. It would be really nice if it was steps up, but it's neither of those. That's not the way it exists in real life. It is more of a undulating wave going up and what we're trying to do is get that biggest last little peak the week of the games. And the way we do that is by varying different um, variables. Yep. So think, um, intensity, volume, um, frequency, duration. So in the recovery portion, it's the opposite, right? In the recovery portion, it is um, work out once a day, do maybe a strength piece, do maybe a Metcon, um, call it a day, or maybe you jump on a rower for 15, 20 minutes. Yep. That's what it looks like in recovery phase. From there, it continues to build in all of those different categories, duration, intensity, frequency, and intensity, until we get to the time, the week before the games when they're training eight to 10 hours a day, doing six to eight different pieces at maximum intensities and maximum loads. So what we're doing is trying to make sure that we're not doing that too early in the year, because if you do that, you need to have August. Right. You need to have a recovery period after that. It's unsustainable. Yeah. You can't be there 365. So we try to be there is five. Yeah. And knowing that after the five, we need 30. Yep. We need the 30 days to recover. Um, and so the reason I hesitated, and I think maybe you just spoke to it a little bit, but the reason I hesitated in the original question is because of now where the importance of the open is, or, mm-hmm. or could be if you choose oh, to. Oh, cool. Yeah, good. And, yeah. and the the variability of okay I'm going to do this sanctional on yep. this day but if I don't qualify it means I'm going to need to do this one on that day so does that do you take that into account as you think about that those that process or do you still say we're going to get to the games because those are the athletes who I work with and so we're going to still focus on the, yeah, the five days it's a little bit of both okay. so um, the the real honest answer is um, no one knows how to do this perfectly yeah. Um, Especially right now, because we're so new into this, um, you know, CrossFit 3.0 or whatever you want to call this. If CrossFit before the games is yep. 1.0, CrossFit Games is 
uh, 2.0 and CrossFit, this version with national champions and no more regionals is 3.0. No one really knows how the 3.0 season is going to um, work itself out. What we are trying to do is hold on to our fitness after the games a little bit to get through the open. Yep. Um, if we don't qualify to the open, then we got to go through a, se- a, a sectional, sanctional, Sanction. uh, old habits die hard. That's <laughs> real old school CrossFit se- sectionals. Um, but um, what we're trying to do is we're still not trying to peak for the open. Yeah. So it is this little upswing. We'll do the open and then maybe a little recovery after that as well. You're not going to hold on to your peak throughout the year. So knowing that we will work a little bit harder. Well, I take it back. We're working a lot harder in September than we ever have because mm-hmm. um, September used to be a continued recovery. Um, now it's uh, certainly more work to try to do something in the open. Mm-hmm. Are different kind of athletes going to be rewarded for this new season, this new kind of schedule than older, not older, like age-wise, but, but athletes who found success earlier where they literally only had to not not literally, but they really um, focused on those five days. Whereas now, an athlete who potentially could could go at a higher percentage throughout the year, do they somehow have an advantage now? That yeah, they I think they do. Before. Yeah, because you can because before you had uh, it was really you had to be good in February when yep. the Open was yep. to qualify for regionals. So you had to be good, and they had to be really really good in May during regionals, and they had to peak once in. Yep um in august now it's very different it, you could almost pick to peak at any one of these um sanctional events at any time you could choose to peak in november and get to the games yep. when everyone else is flying underneath the radar yep. so it's a definitely a different landscape um we don't know what this is going to look like but the question was, does this favor a different athlete? Yeah. Will we see, will, you know, over the next year or two, will we see different kinds of athletes or athletes who have different strengths versus weaknesses? I don't think so. Yeah. I think the difference is um, it's easier than it's ever been to get to the games. Mm. Yep. The top 20 athletes are in through the open. Yep. Now take the top 20 at the games and you no longer have to essentially compete against them at regionals. But there's not one regional that you can go to. You can go to, no, this year there's almost 30. There's like oh, really? 27 oh, wow. regionals. So you have 27 regionals that you have the opportunity to qualify through. Now I get they only take one. Yep. They don't take five like they yep. used to. So maybe it's kind of the same-ish after that. But you also take the national champs out. You're taking so many of the top athletes out of the regional field. And as we saw last year, what we thought was going to be the hardest games ever to qualify for because what we were told is you either need to win the open or be a national champ or win a, sec- a sanctional event. Um, that became a lot e- when they take the top 20 out of the open. Yeah. That changes that completely because mm-hmm. all those athletes in the top 20 would be winning those events and now they're gone. Now it goes to the next tier. Um, one of the things that uh, intentionally or not you and you th- and CompTrain through you have have been able to kind of put your stamp on is um, coaching and working with really high level female competitors. We've got Katrin, Brooke, Amanda Barnhart is also a, a comp trainer, um, though she doesn't work with you specifically. Um, how, do you think about training females differently than you do males? Um, are there things that you have to do or don't or you you know you don't do because of whatever the the differences that you've that you've come to to realize um, between you know between Catherine and Nicole, for example? One of the beauties of our sport is um, the lack of gender bias. It is one of the rare sports where um, everything is the same, from the airtime on TV to the prize money to the uh, number of events and everything else. It's so cool that it's the same yep because it's the same the training is the same so in terms of taking into account like certain physiological factors um i don't these athletes they male and female side seem to peak at the same time which is 26 27 seems to be the peak for a crossfit games athlete age Age wise yep. yep um I think that if anything, maybe the girl side has a little bit longer lifespan. They can come in a little bit earlier. Brooke Wells, Haley Adams, and can stay a little bit longer. Sam Briggs. Yep. Then the guy side, which seems to be a little bit shorter. You know, maybe some of the younger Pancheck kids are the the youngest ones, but I think they're in their twenties. Yep. And then the oldest ones being, I don't even know who the oldest athletes are now, but thirty one. Um, it might be a little bit shorter of a window. 
Besides that, the events are the same, the demands are the same, the volume is the same, nothing changes at all in terms of the training. In terms of how in tune I am with my female athletes, like do I know their cycles and all that stuff? Um, some I do and some I don't. Mm -hmm. um, um, but that's more factor, just like how close I am with them, I yep. think. Um, and then um, in terms of the actual way I coach them, um, I, I, I think I lean towards coaching females because I think that females are um, easier to coach. Mm. They, Meaning that they're more coachable? Yes, yeah. correct. Yep. Um, here's I, here's I, I heard a basketball coach say this once. He says, if you talk to a team of, of um, male basketball players and you say, we need to be tougher, we need to give more effort. The individual players on the team are thinking in their heads, looking around like, yeah, they do need to be tougher. <laughs> they need to give yeah. more effort. Whereas a female would say that and the female goes, he's talking to me. Yeah. I need to be tougher. I'm... They just take ownership really well. Mm. They kind of lean into it a little bit better. Um, it's about, um, they seem to enjoy coaching a little bit more. Maybe, I, don't, I don't think it's an ego thing. Mm. Um, I think it's just an inherent thing of like, you know, it's Brene Brown type stuff. Like guys inherently are not supposed to show weakness. Yep. Girls are like more vulnerable and can yep. be able to lean into it a little bit deeper. Yep. Now, the athletes I coach are all coachable and they're yep. all hungry and they're right. all humble and they all want to, but, you know, percentage points over coaching them for four or five years show up a lot, mm -hmm. you know, um, so I think that's kind of maybe a, a, an, an overstatement or a generalization, but that's definitely something I've seen, the difference between guys and girls. Yeah. Um, jumping into the games a little bit, um, the, the actual, the week of the games, um, what is, what are the, what have you seen to be the, the psychological benefits or um, downfalls of an athlete wearing a leader jersey um, at any point other than at the end of the event, mm -hmm. right? You, you know, if you... Have, what have you seen? How do you help an athlete um, deal with? Is a strange way to put it, but deal yeah. with the the whatever that might be stress, the anxiety, the the worry, the the added attention of on Friday morning first workout is you've got the white jersey on now, and so everybody's chasing you theoretically. How do you how do you as a coach, and then how do the athletes work through that? Um, I mean, it's obviously going to depend on the athlete, but how do you, from a coaching perspective? work on that. Yeah. In the, in the last two years, I wish I had more, more, <laughs> more issues with that. Um, but I've certainly worked with athletes that have been wearing the leader Jersey, yeah. both at the end of the weekend and throughout. Um, if the athletes are, um, focusing on the right thing and they're competing with excellence that should not play into account. That's kind of like the same thing as the leaderboard, but essentially, um, what's happening is in their minds, it's all eyes are on me. Mm -hmm. So there can be another level of pressure. Um, I need to sustain this. You know, in terms of um, the Tour de France, like th when Lance used to do this, he, they didn't. The team didn't. You know, Team U.S. Postal did not want the leader jersey until a certain point in the race because you had to defend too much. Yeah. You had to. Do, it changed things a little Interesting, bit. Interesting. Yeah. So we don't go that route of saying like you know like let's purposely stay right. in second place. Right. We, def we just put all the focus into um, effort and strategy and our ability and try to maximize those things and let the other things kind of fall where they went may. Having said that, the first time Katrin ever wore the leader jersey um, was a, like a, a near catastrophe. Mm. So um, this is the year that after she failed to make the game because she like cried on the floor after yep. falling off of a rope. Well the CrossFit gods like opened up the skies and um, tested her mm -hmm. at the games that year, right before they took the field for legless rope climbs, the athlete control director angel came over and gave Katrin the white leader's Jersey. Mm -hmm. We didn't know she was in first place and said, you're in first place. Congratulations. Here's your leader Jersey. Now go enjoy your legless rope <laughs> climbs. Like, Holy crap. Yeah. Right. Like, 
Um, so that was a test yeah. for sure. Um, an amazing opportunity for us to see where we've come to this mental game. Yeah. So we had a conversation about what are the things we should be focusing on, what are the things we should be not focusing on. And we reframed it in our minds into something that this is very um, um, doable. This mm-hmm. is not something that we need to be scared of. This is not something we need to be excited about. This is just a thing. And it's not anything else than you climbing ropes in the gym. That's all that's happening. Yeah. So if you can reframe things, it shouldn't matter that much. Now, the flip side of that is wearing the leader jersey later in the event, freaking awesome, yeah, right? Like right. You're, you're doing, you've done everything you're supposed to do, you're kicking ass, it's a confidence boost. Yeah. That is um, something that is a boon to the athletes. Um, if you're in the mix, in a, forget about the whole overall competition, in a particular event, if you're in the mix, you're one of the top three athletes, and they go, Bring your attention to lane number four in fourth yep. place is Patrick Cummings making his move. He's now in third place. Like, feels good. It feels good. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. right. That feels yeah. good. Yep. So that's essentially the same thing. Like in between events, you have the leader jersey. You feel like you're pushing all the right buttons. You feel like you belong. You feel like you're supposed to be there. Yep. Um, you feel like you can fight um regardless and that's kind of a nice place to be nice um you mentioned leaderboarding uh we've definitely talked about leaderboarding a handful of times here on the podcast but um this year potentially maybe changed how you think about leaderboarding um given that at the games this year there were a few there were there were a few cuts right so you yep. needed to you needed to be on the in the top whatever to make it to day two you need to be in the top whatever to make it today you know to the the rest of the competition did that does that play a factor in you and your athletes paying a little bit more attention to, okay, where am I after event two? Because if I'm below the cut line, and maybe you tell me, like, does it matter? Does that make them, like, they can't magically become a different person. Yeah. You can't ask them to try harder because they're already trying as hard as they can. Right. Right. So does that help or is it just another uncontrollable that you say, nope, we're still going to push it away? So so this year at the games, um, after certain events, they essentially said, like, we're cutting half the field out. Yeah. After another set of events, we're cutting 30 athletes. Another set, we're down to only the top 20 and then we're down to the top 10. So uh, where you are on the leaderboard throughout the weekend mattered a ton. It wasn't just about after the last 12th or 13th yep. event. Yep. I am all about um, looking for ways to maximize performance. If I believe looking at the leaderboard can give us potential for maximized performance, I want to do that. If I believe looking at the leaderboard is going to potentially hurt performance, I don't want them doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, the strange thing about this year was you didn't have an option of whether you were looking at or not. Before and after every event, they said, in 13th place, mm. dot, dot, dot. Yep. In 12th place, dot, dot, dot. In 11th place, dot, dot, dot. In 10th place, dot, dot, dot. Everybody I just named, go stand over there. Thank you very much. Your weekend is over. So mm-hmm. you knew after every event what place you're in. Yeah. So that whole theory we've had about don't follow the leaderboard kind of got scrapped. And here's what I mean by like, can it benefit you or hurt you? If you're going into an event like a sprint before they cut to the top 10 athletes and you're in 12th or 13th place and sprinting is not your, you're not, it's not your forte. Yep. Man, that can kind of like be a bummer. Yep. Like you're, you're like, you know that the other girls are faster than you. Um, you don't know that, but um, you know that in the past, like sprinting has not been something you've been in the top with and um, you're on the outside looking in right now. That can, that can be tough. Well, if you're the type of person that looks at that, thinks about that, tries to analyze it, who do I need to beat to get there? What what do I think they're, that's going to hurt you instead of like, go out there and do everything you possibly can, which is what Katrin did. And Katrin was able to get into the top 10. Now, that's where I want them not to focus on the leaderboard because it can be hurtful. If she's focusing on it, she's like, I don't even know how this is going to, how is this possibly going to work out? You have no idea. Where it can be helpful is, um, is it time to take a risk? That's where it can be helpful. So mm-hmm. let's say it's the type of thing where it's um, a max effort lift. You know what the other athletes have lifted. Yep. You know what you need to lift to get into the top 10. If you know those numbers, you know where you stand, then if you can do the math quickly, it makes sense to base your strategy off of that because otherwise, if you just do what you think you would do anyway and you're on the outside looking in, like it might be the time to take a risk. Yeah. 
similar, maybe it's not max effort lift, it's you're going to kick up into a handstand. And should you just kind of go for it? Now, there's upsides and downsides to going for it because you don't know if other people are going to miss their lifts or whatever it might yeah. be. Um, the, the, the best consistent bet is just give it your best very, very best. Know that this was the best that you could come up with, um, either a lift or a time and a workout. And from there, if you do that across the board, things are going to shake out. You'll be able to walk away with pride. Yeah. Um, jumping back into the gym and, and training <clears throat> for the games or for these for these events, you know, we've talked before about um, the the balance that you're always trying to 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 find between the stress of training hard and the the recovery of that and mm -hmm. and that you know we get stronger in large part by the recovery mm -hmm. not necessarily by the stress so with that in mind what how do you know how hard to push an athlete to make sure that they're you know to some degree to make sure that they're failing enough to learn from something yep. um but not pushing them so hard that they certainly that they get injured that that's obvious but so that um, pushing them so hard that maybe their recovery gets hard. Like, how do you yeah. know from a coach's perspective? Like, okay, today's the day I'm gonna I'm gonna make Catherine go harder than she she wants to, right? Whatever yeah. that means. Or how do I know today's the day not to do that? Where is like, how do you navigate that? What feels to me like a a really hard like place to land on a daily basis, and, yes. do, and you know, and do it really well. If you are able to maximize what you just said, maximize training threshold so that the person can respond respond from that stimulus and get an adaptation and come back to the gym stronger the next day, and then you micro dose it again, the yep. appropriate amount, and they come back to the gym stronger the next day, you have hacked the formula of creating a superhuman, mm -hmm. which is what we do with these games athletes. We have hacked how to get the most out of these athletes from a training volume intensity frequency and duration st play and then how much is the minimum recovery required to be able to get them back in the gym and do it again mm -hmm. that's the game we're playing no one's doing it perfectly because if you did it perfectly you'd be literally be able to get the athlete that can back squat a thousand pounds and run a four minute mile yep. the capacities on both ends but we're trying to get as close as we can to that it's really, as you said, really, really hard. And that's the game. Yeah. That's why recovery matters so much. That's why the time and effort you put in the gym matters so much. So the second side of that question, which I kind of heard was, how do you get them to work really, really hard without like without there without being taking a, a hole yeah, or exactly, getting hurt? Without there being a detriment to that. Here's the, the way I like to do it is you get them to work really, really hard really hard in um, low CNS and risk environments. Okay. So think like a salt bike. Mm -hmm. Like I can get you to fail on a salt bike and you're probably gonna be fine tomorrow and you're not gonna get hurt. Mm -hmm. If I ask you to um, fail from fatigue on a set of clean and jerks, like I don't know what's happening tomorrow. Right. So you can use these safe environments to learn your athletes and where those thresholds are. What what is what do their body mechanics look like when they get to that threshold and go past it? What is their facial expressions? What's their breathing? What's the shoulders look like? What's and you start to figure out like okay, now I can pull this across the other modalities that we're doing. Now with thrusters, I can see that like where we are and what this looks like. I would never want to do that with, you know, um, you know, squat snatches, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's just like yeah. the risk reward is way too high. Yeah. Now, as I learn these things, now we can start to play with those areas with squat snatches, mm -hmm. which we need to do in our sport. Yep. But to, for me to take a brand new athlete and to say, this is what we're we're gonna do this many reps on the minute at this load, knowing it's too much for them to handle. Uh, I'm sorry, not knowing if it's too much for them to handle. That's an irresponsible approach from a coach. Yep. What I need to know is first, like where, how close I am I to that threshold? And when I'm watching them, um, are they teetering over the edge? And is this the right place to push them past that or not? Mm -hmm. and that's based off a lot of different factors. Like we answered in the first question, when I ask them when they come in that day, yeah. what are they saying? If they're like, I'm ready to 
chew concrete and spit out nails. I feel awesome. Yep. Like, let's freaking go. Like, I can't, like, that might be the day we do it. Mm-hmm. If they walk in, they're like, I feel okay. Well, what do you mean okay? Like, I don't know. Like, sleep wasn't so great. And, you know, I just, I'm, I'm ready to go. Like, let's do this, coach. It's <laughs> yeah, like, that might be a different, different day. Different environment. Yeah. yeah. Um, last question. Um, something we've talked about to some degree, um, but as it uh, as we're you know we're we're coming off of the game certainly this year, how do you as a coach um, and your and how and your athletes maybe specifically how do they how do you guys handle defeat how do you handle coming you know because our sport is still one weekend effectively yeah. right yep. so almost everybody walks away yep. defeated to yeah. some degree um, except for Matt and Tia except for Matt and Tia. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> How do you how do you process and Rich Froning on the team side? That's right. Yeah. They just have a they they live together literally, so yeah. they just yeah. go home and high five each other. And, um, how do you guys like? How do you process that defeat? What does what does that process look like to make sure that you learn from it, but that you're better for it, or that you let it go? How do you define defeat? Yep. And you, to me, it's kind of like how do you define success? If success is the if the only way you're going to achieve success is by standing on the middle of the podium, wow, we then then we're gonna have to then we're gonna have to really spend some time on this question. Yep. If you define success in other metrics, then um, you can ask yourself if you lost and if you were defeated. Yep. So in in Catherine's sense, um, her definition of success, not her words, but something along the lines of to give my best at every given moment in every given situation, be able to look in the mirror knowing that that was my very best effort regardless of the circumstances I was facing. Okay, so then at the end of the games, when she comes in fourth place, you know, in a games that was not, you know, without digging too deep into the the, the programming, but in a games that was not suited for her skill set, is that a defeat? Mm -hmm. And if we let society or the leaderboard dictate that? The answer is yes. Like we are there to win. If we don't win, we're not satisfied. If we think of it in terms of uh, maximizing our abilities, performing um, with competitive excellence, having the right mindset and um, preparedness for every event, and being able to walk away, look in the mirror, knowing that was our best, um, that was really far from it. Catherine said that this year was the, the most she, proud she's been walking out of games. Mm. So it's kind of how you frame things, right? If I try a new um, revenue stream for a business and it fails and it doesn't do well, is it's only a defeat if I don't learn from it. Mm-hmm. And if it pulls me away from what I value. So if I ignored my family forever trying to make this thing happen and it didn't work and it's like and i eventually at the end of it i was like damn it that sucks that sucks i wasted six months of my life and just go back to status quo that's a defeat but if you go okay wow like i really pulled away from what was important to me like i need to spend i can't believe i did that next time this comes along like i'm gonna be successful for the things i say no to not the things i say yes to if you are like oh my gosh i can't believe that um you know i didn't execute um this i didn't have this clarity i didn't have this business plan i didn't have this level of execution and standards and i didn't build the right team around me okay i'm learning and that's not defeat at all like mm-hmm. so i think it's a matter it's not a matter of like sunshine and rainbows and we have unicorns running in the backyard and trying to put like a smiley face on every frowny face that's not what this is about it is literally about frame it like it's about learning from everything if you learn from these experiences you know that can't be a defeat. Like I, I just, I, I'm, I love what Kobe Bryant says about that. He's like, there's no. They, they ask him like, what's your biggest failure? And this is a guy that, in his rookie season, the championship game, shot three air balls, mm-hmm. three game potential winning air balls in the last forty seconds of the game. He's the only person on his team that shot. He shot three air balls, and they're like, what's the biggest failure of your career? And he's like, I don't have any because mm. I've learned from them all. Like, in that case, like, what are defeats? Like, if you're learning from them. The end of us is not the end of the games. The end of us is not the end of our careers. The end of us is the end of us. Is when we walk off this face of the earth. So if we're learning and iterating and coming better and better in that process, like what's the defeats? These are all stepping stones that are going to make us better human beings. We just want to be ultimately fulfilled when we walk 
when we take that final breath. Mm -hmm. Let's leave it there. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. We'll see everybody next week. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.